in English, the verse would read, Truth has come, falsehood has vanished, surely falsehood is a vanishing thing. Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is going to be the third part in the Ghadir examination, the Ghadir series. In part one and two, we covered the methodology one should have when entering polemics. The Sunni and Salafi scholars' stance on Hadith al-Ghadir, the authenticity of Hadith al-Ghadir, and the meaning of Hadith al-Ghadir as well. Now, in this part, we're going to be addressing it into two main sections. The first section is going to be Ahl Sunnah's common arguments and their refutations, and part two is going to be mainly focused on the Shia corpus and some cool, interesting hadiths from there. I didn't go fully in depth and gather a bunch of sources from the Shia corpus because our corpus is very, very clear on Ghadir. Like you'll see, like one hadith will just be like, "Yeah, he's the Prophet's Khalifa." Everyone came and gave bayah. So. Our corpus is very clear on Ghadir. The mainly, mainly what we're going to, need to be discussing is the Sunni corpus. So I didn't go too in-depth there, but there are still some very cool and interesting reports. Regarding their arguments, one thing I would like to say before we go in is that Ahl Sunnah cannot say our interpretation is wrong. They can only say that they have another interpretation. That like, no, this is wrong. This is the correct interpretation. In regards to this, if you just show them how their interpretation doesn't go through, they're only left with our interpretation, which by then we just, we'd win. The very first common argument, and uh, a lot of brothers are asking about this inside yesterday's lectures and in, uh, just after the event in general, it's the Yemen argument, the Yemen cope. The Yemen argument is very simple. Basically, it's, their argument is this. Ali ibn Abi Talib was sent with a couple of Sahaba, their names being Buraida, Khalid ibn Walid, and Amr ibn Shas al-Aslami. Those are like the main names. He was sent with them to Yemen, previous to Ghadir Khum. Then an argument had happened there, a fight had happened there. Then when they came back, the Prophet says they did their hajj. After their hajj, the Prophet stopped and he just said, Whoever I am, his friend or supporter, Ali is his friend and supporter. And that's, the, that's it. That's all the event. That's the context of Ghadir. And that's essentially why the Prophet stopped. Uh, nothing to do with authority, nothing to do with leadership. That's kind of the argument really summarized. Now we're going to just list where this hadith is found. It's in Bukhari. Specific tab'a I'm using is Al-Bagha. So this is the scan that we're going to be posting. And it says, it's hadith number 4093. Skipping the chain for the sake of time. The Prophet sent Ali to Khalid to collect the fifth of the spoils as zakat. I used to dislike, this is Borid in the meeting by the way, I used to dislike Ali at that time, and he had just performed ghusl. So I said to Khalid, don't you see this referring to Ali? When we met the Prophet, I mentioned to him, then he said, O oh, Borida, do you dislike Ali? I said, yes. He said, don't dislike him, for he has a larger share in these spoils than that. That's the first variation of the hadith. The second one uh, is in Kitab al-Sunnah, uh, Kitab al-Sunnah al-Kubra, volume 7, page 137. Again, just skipping the chain, narrated from Barida once again. He says, The Messenger of Allah sent us on a military expedition and appointed Ali as our leader. When we returned, he asked us, How did you find the companionship of your leader? So either I complained about him or someone else complained about him. I lifted my head and I was a man of dark complexion. And behold, the face of the Messenger of Allah had turned red. He said, Whoever I am his Mola, Ali is his Mola. That's the second reference for this hadith. The third reference is in Tirmidhi 3712. And this hadith is actually very similar to the hadith we showed yesterday, where he said, Ali wa liyu kulli mu'min min ba'di. Narrated Amr ibn Hussain, the Messenger of Allah, dispatched an army and put Ali ibn Abi Talib in charge of it. He left on an expedition and he entered upon a female slave. So four of the companions of the Messenger of Allah scolded him and they made a pact saying, If we meet the Messenger of Allah, we will inform him of what Ali did. When the Muslims returned from their journey, they would begin with the Messenger of Allah and give him salams, then they would go back to their homes. So when the expedition arrived, they gave salam to the Prophet and one of, one of the four stood up saying, O oh, Messenger of Allah, did you see that Ali ibn Abi Talib did such and such? The Messenger of Allah turned away from him. Then the second one stood up and said as he said, and he turned away from him. Then the third stood up and said as he said, and he turned away from him. Then the fourth stood up and said as he had said, the Messenger of Allah faced him and anger was visible on his face and he said, What do you want from Ali? What do you want from Ali? What do you want from Ali? Indeed, Ali is from me and I am from him and he is the wali of every believer after me. And the grade of this hadith is Hassan. Virtually the same exact rope. Actually, no, this one's very different, actually. Astaghfirullah, that was another chain. Tirmidhi 1704. The Prophet sent two armies, placing Ali ibn Abi Talib as the commander of one and Khalid ibn Walid as the commander of the other. He said, where there is fighting, then Ali is in command. If you guys were to link up both armies and there's a fight happening, Ali's in charge. Ali has 
the higher authority. So when Ali conquered a fortress and took a slave girl, Khalid bin Walid wrote a letter and sent it to the Prophet of Allah to speak against him for it. So I wrapped to the Prophet to read the letter. The color of his face changed and he said, What do you think about a man who loves Allah and his messenger and Allah and his messenger love him? He said, I seek refuge from angering Allah and angering his messenger. I am only the messenger. So he was silent. Commentary just says this is a Hassan hadith. It's gharib. Tirmidhi 3725, the Prophet dispatched two armies, skipping what we already said. He said, yep, the, basically the same exact hadith as the one before. That's Tirmidhi 3725, another reference for it. This one, I believe, yeah, this one has a difference. It's going to be Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba, volume 17, page 129. Uh, narrated from Marbara ibn Azib, the Messenger of Allah sent two armies to Yemen. Uh, the Messenger of Allah sent two armies, one led by Ali ibn Abi Talib and the other by uh, Khalid ibn Walid. He said, that if there is fighting, then Ali is in charge. Ali conquered a fortress and took a captive woman for himself while Khalid was disheveled. When the Messenger of Allah read the letter, he said, what do you say about a man who loves Allah and his Messenger and Allah's Messenger love him? And I was just saying, it was married in Tirmidhi. Now this one is in Fadail al-Sahaba, volume 1, page 856 to 857. Uh, the narrator is Buraida once again. Ali, the messenger of Allah, sent two envoys to Yemen. One of them was Ali ibn Abi Talib and the other was Khalid ibn Walid. He said, if you meet each other, then Ali is in charge of the people. And if you separate, each one of you leads his own soldiers. He said, so we encountered the Banu Zayd from the people of Yemen and we fought. And the Muslims prevailed over the polytheists. We killed those who fought and took the, their offspring as captives. Then he chose a woman from the captives for himself. Buraida said, so Khalid ibn Walid wrote to the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, informing him of the events. Therefore, thereafter, when I came to the Prophet, I handed him the letter, and he asked me to recite it to him. I saw the anger on his face. I saw the anger on the face of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. So I said, "O Messenger of Allah, this is a place of seeking refuge. You sent me with a man and command me to obey him, and I fulfilled what I was sent with." The Messenger of Allah said, "Do not raise any issue against Ali, for he is from me, and I am from him, and he is your wali after me. Indeed, he is from me, and I am from him, and he is your wali after me." And the footnote says this hadith, this chain is Hassan. So that one was with a lot more detail. This one again goes into more detail as well. It's in Fadail al-Sahaba, volume 1, 800, page 859 to 860. The narrator again is Buraida. He said, I developed intense animosity towards Ali, a level of animosity I have never harbored towards anyone before. And if I developed love for a man from the Quraysh solely due to his hatred, and I developed love for men from Quraysh solely due to their hatred for Ali, he said. So this man sent a message to Ali, mounted on horses, and I accompanied him only because of my hatred for Ali. Then we encountered a group and took them as captives. He said, so he wrote to the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, saying, said, send someone to collect us to collect their fifth of the spoils. The Messenger of Allah sent Ali to us. And among the captives was a woman who was one of the most excellent women. The spoils were abundant and they were divided. And his head was dripping. So we said, oh, Abel Hassan, what is this? He said, did you not see the woman who was among the captives? I divided and distributed the spoils and it became a portion of the fifth. Then it became a portion of the household of the Prophet. And then it became a portion of the family of Ali. And it fell to her. He said, and the man wrote to the Prophet of Allah and said, send me a witness. He said, so I began to read the letter and my sadaqah and say sadaqta, meaning you are truthful. He said, then he held his hand and the letter and he asked me, do you harbor animosity towards Ali? I said, yes. He said, do you do not harbor animosity towards him? And if you love him, then increase in your love for him. By the one in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad, 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 the share of Ali's family in the fifth is better than the woman. He said, after the statement of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, there was no one dearer to me than Ali. The footnote reads, the chain is Hassan, due to it being Sahih by other chains. The next one is in uh, Musnad Ahmed, volume 38, page 50, 65 to 67, uh, narrated by Buraida again. I developed an, uh, intense hatred towards Ali. It's the same narration as the one before. Yeah. Yeah, it's literally the same exact report, except this one is through a Sahih chain. Uh, so I'm not going to read through it again for the sake of time. The next narration is in Al Sunan Al Kubra, volume 7, page 443 to 444. Uh, Musa al Rawayni, volume 1, on page 224, hadith number 309. The Messenger of Allah sent two armies, one under the command of Ali ibn Abi Talib and the, under, and the other under the command of Khalid ibn Walid. The Prophet said, When there is fighting, Ali should be in charge. So Ali besieged the fortress and took a captive for himself. He wrote to Khalid, and when the Messenger of Allah read the letter, he said, What would you say about a man who loves Allah and his Messenger, and Allah and his Messenger love him? Uh, moving on, let me see. Musa al Ahmed, volume 33, on page 154. The narrator is Amran ibn Hussein. Moving on, the Messenger of Allah sent a military expedition and appointed Ali ibn Abi Talib as their leader. During their journey, Ali did something significant, so four companions of, the, uh, of Muhammad made an agreement to mention it to the Messenger of Allah. Amran said, when we returned from the journey, we would start with the Messenger of Allah and greet him. He said, they entered upon him, and one of them stood up and said, O Messenger of Allah, Ali did such and such. The Messenger turned away, then the second one stood up and said, O Messenger of Allah, Ali did such and such. 
The messenger turned away from him. Then the third one stood up and said, O Messenger of Allah, Ali did such and such. The messenger turned away from him as well. Then the fourth one stood up and said, O Messenger of Allah, Ali did such and such. The messenger, peace be upon him, turned towards the fourth one and his face had changed. He said, Leave Ali, leave Ali, leave him. Indeed, Ali is from me and I am from him. And he is the wali of every believer after me. And at the bottom, it is the tahqiq saying that the narrators are reliable. So that would conclude all the variations of the hadith. Um, moving on now, it's going to be all the Sunni scholars who use this as an argument, who originally formulated this into a full argument, saying that this was the reason Vadir Khum had even took place. The very first one is Sharh uh, Sunan ibn Majah by Al-Sindi on volume 1, page 56, 55 to 56. It was said that the reason for this was that Ali spoke about it to some of those who were with him in Yemen. So the Prophet intended this by, by this to endear them to Ali. Uh, it is narrated from Rabah ibn Azwa that the Prophet sent two armies and appointed Ali as their leader, as the leader of one, and Khalid as the leader of the other. And he said, During the battle, Ali conquered a fortress and took a captive woman from it. Khalid then wrote a letter to the Prophet informing him of this. So I presented myself to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he read the letter. His face changed color, and then he said, What do you think of a man who loves Allah and his messenger, and Allah and his messenger love him? I said, I seek refuge in Allah from Allah's anger and his messenger's anger. Indeed, I am only a messenger. So I remained silent. At Tirmidhi classified this hadith as Hassan, and based on this, the meaning of am I not more authoritative am I not more authoritative over the believers is am I not more deserving of their love, honor, and sincere devotion, just as a father is deserving of the love and devotion of his children. This indicates his statement, exalted be he in the Quran, and then to the end of the couple things to dissect here. This is not I believe this not this is not the first person to use this argument, but he comments on the wording Alastu Aula bil Muinimin and Fusi. Do I not have more authority over the believers than themselves? And he says this is in regards to just uh, loving and being endearing to your kids the same way a father is to his children. This wouldn't make any sense because the Prophet is using the word awla, authority. There's nothing about love here. But inshallah, this will be, dissect, this will be more in depth and showing how this has nothing to do with Yemen inshallah ta'ala. But that's the first scholar we'll bring. Uh, the second one is in Mukhtasar al-Tuhfa al-Ithna Ashariya by al-Dahlawi on page 162. And he said the reason for this sermon, meaning Ghadir, as mentioned by the historians and biographers, clearly indicates that its purpose was to emphasize the obligation of loving the leader, meaning Ali. This is because some of the companions who were absent with the leader during the expedition to Yemen, such as Buraida al-Aslami, Khalid bin Walid, and others among the well-known companions, complained about the leader after they returned from their journey. So the Prophet spoke about him in this manner. This story has been detailed by Muhammad ibn Ashaq and other uh, among the biographers. So that's the second scholar who uses this argument. The third one is in Ruh al-Ma'ani by al-Alusi, volume 3 on page 360. So we say, indeed the Prophet was in a place between Mecca and Medina upon this return from the farewell pilgrimage, near the location of Juhfa, known as Ghadir Khum. It was there that, the that he highlighted the virtues of Ali, Karamallah Wajha, and declared his innocence from the allegations that some individuals in the land of Yemen had made against him, due to their misunderstanding and unjust criticism. The truth is with Ali, Karamallah Wajha, in that matter, this incident took place on a Sunday, the 18th of the Hajjah, under a tree in that area. So al Alusi uses this argument as well. al Malqat al-Mafatih, volume 11, and page number 247 and 248. And it is said that the reason for the mention of this hadith, as transmitted by uh, al hafiz Shamsuddin al-Jaza'ari from Ibn Ishaq, is that Ali said to some of them, of those who were with him in Yemen, when the Prophet completed his sermon during his fellow pilgrimage, he used it as a reminder to, of his authority and as a response to those like, who spoke against Ali, such as Buraida, as mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. The reason for this, as narrated by al Dhabi and authenticated by him, is that Ali accompanied the Prophet to Yemen and observed a lack of respect towards the Prophet from some individuals. This caused his face, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, to change. And he said, O oh, Barida, am I, not more am I not more authoritative over the believers than they are over themselves? I said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. And Ahmed and Tirmidhi narrated it. The final scholar who uses this uh, is Ibn Kathir in al Bidayah wa Nihaya, volume 7, page 665 and 666. Now also, before I read this one out, I've heard a lot, a lot of people say that Ibn Taymiyyah and Al-Tabari both use this. I have not seen any evidence to suggest so. I tried looking into it, going through all the, the stuff. I did not find them using this. If any brothers have that on hand or would like to add this, inshallah, like after the event, that would be great. But Ibn Kathir says this. In mentioning the hadith that indicates that he delivered a sermon at a location between Mecca and Medina upon his return from the farewell pilgrimage near Juhfa known as Ghadir Khum, there he highlighted the virtue of Ali ibn Abi Talib and declared his innocence from the allegations made against him by some individuals who were with him in the land of Yemen. This was due to their misunderstanding and unjust criticism of him. The truth was on Ali's side in that matter. Therefore, when he وآله, completed and explained the rituals and then he returned to Medina, during which he delivered a significant sermon on the 18th of Dhul-Hajjah of that year, it was a Sunday at Ghadir Khum under a tree. In that sermon, he highlighted Ali's virtues, merits, trustworthiness, and close relationship with the Prophet. This, deserved, this served to dispel doubts and misconceptions that he had lingered in the hearts of many people. That wraps up all the scholars who use this. Now, this section of the video is going to be refuting this argument. So the very first thing regarding Yemen 
that people don't understand is that Ali عليه, was sent to Yemen twice, not once. And this is all over the historical books. The first one being Asir al Nabawiya li Ibn Hisham, volume 4, page 290. Asir al Nabawiya li Ibn Hisham, and then he says the expedition of Ali ibn Abi Talib to Yemen. Ali ibn Abi Talib عليه, conquered Yemen. He traveled there twice. He's like, Ghazwat Ali ibn Abi Talib ila Yemen, Ghazaha maratain. So he went there twice. That's the first historical report. The second one is in At Tabaqat al Kubra, volume 2, page 154. Here it says the same thing. The expedition of Ali ibn Abi Talib ta'ala عليه, to Yemen, it is said to have occurred twice. Then there was another expedition of Ali ibn Abi Talib to Yemen. It is said to have occurred twice, with one of them taking place in the month of Ramadan, in the 10th year after Hijrah of the Messenger of Allah. So here, this is the first one, we get an actual confirmed date. Ali ibn Abi Talib, one of his trips was directly before Hajjat al Wada. So just before it. That's his first trip. The second one is in Fath al Bari, volume 8 on page 65. And actually, yeah, you, the second one will be, we'll show you guys shortly in a sec where, when it, when it happened. Commission of Ali ibn Abi Talib bin Khalid bin Walid to Yemen before the farewell pilgrimage. So actually, here, the scholars of Ahl Sunnah, they don't actually, they're actually mixing up both the reports. They'll say that, oh, this trip with uh, Khalid was right before Hajj al Wada. But you'll see in a second, this is completely not true. Jabir reported that Ali came from Yemen and met the Prophet in Mecca during the farewell pilgrimage. The narration is missing at the end of the chapter. His statement, we, was, we sent the messenger of Allah with Khalid bin Walid to Yemen, occurred after the return from Ta'if and the dis dis distribution of spoils in Al Jarrana. One was in the incident of Ta'if, and the other one was right before Hajj al Wada. Now, when did Ta'if take place? This will be made clear in just one sec. The next one is in Amdat al Qarih, volume 18, on page 6. He says, once again, the Messenger of Allah, uh, no, the journey of Ali ibn Abi Talib and Khalid bin Walid to Yemen before the fell pilgrimage. The mission took place after the return from Taif and the distribution, distribution of spoils in Al Jarrana. So, again, one just after Taif and one before Hajjat al Wada. Now, this one actually gives us more clarification. This is in Rashad al Sari, the Shah Sahih al Bukhari, volume 6, page 421. He says, The Messenger of Allah sent to us bin Khalid bin Walid to Yemen. That is after the return from Taif and the distribution of spoils in Al Jarrana. Then Ali was sent after in his place, meaning in the place of Khalid. Now for some historical time works. This is in al ibar by Dhabi, page 9 to page 10. This is a history book by Dhabi, which basically documents every year after Hijrah, and then like what happened, what took place on this year. So this book was perfect to see when these two trips both happened. So he says, in year A after Hijrah, right? and he says, in Ramadan, towards its end or in the middle, Mecca was conquered, in Shawar, the Battle of Hanin took place. Then he says, the Prophet... Stayed in Ta'if for about 20 nights, then he proceeded and besieged the fortress. Ta'if took place in 8th Hijri. Right? And then year 10, he goes on to say, The Prophet performed the Hajj of Islam along with the, the group of uh, followers with him, from the companions, were 100,000 or more, to the extent that those who had not performed Hajj before or after that year had also performed it. Two things to note here with this report. Ta'if was in 8th Hijri, the feast of Ta'if. And in year 10 after Hijrah, that's when the second trip had happened. Also, uh, the companions that were with him were numbered to be 100,000 or more. But these are just historical reports, so it could be, you know, much less, it could be more maybe, potentially. But this is kind of the rough uh, scale of how much people were there. Now, with that being said, now we have, we've discussed how there's two trips. One trip was in 8 Hijri, and the other trip was in 10 Hijri. Now, which trip are Ahl sunnah referencing? Ahl sunnah always reference the one with Baraida, Khalid, and Amr ibn al Aslam. That's the main one that they're referencing. So when did this one take place? The first reference we'll give to actually prove that this trip with Khalid was in 8 Hijri. Uh, year eight after Hijrah is in Al Majma Al Ausat by Tabarani, volume three, page one hundred and ten. Abu Umama he said, "I saw the Messenger of Allah during the farewell pilgrimage, riding a green mule, being led by Khalid bin Walid." Just for some understanding of the viewers, year ten after Hijrah, the Prophet was not in Medina. The Prophet was he left Medina and he was in Mecca. When Ali returned, Ali did not go to Medina and then go off with the Prophet. Ali actually returned and uh, he just went straight to Mecca because that's where the Prophet was on the journey there. Khalid was with the Prophet, but Ali on the journey of the Prophet was going towards Yemen. He wasn't with the Prophet. So this proves that this could not have been 8 Hijri, rather it was 10 Hijri, when, uh, or astaghfirullah the other way around. It was 8 Hijri when Ali and Khalid were in Yemen together. It could not be 10 Hijri. That's kind of the first report we'll give. The second one is also in the Majma' al Ausat al Tabarani, volume 6, page 162 to 163. Again, skipping the chain, um, Abu Ishaq from Buraida. This is Buraida. He says, The Messenger of Allah sent Ali uh, to Yemen as its governor, and he sent Khalid uh, to the mountains. He said, If both of you meet, then Ali is in charge of the people. Gather together and take one fifth of, uh, and take from the spoils what they have not obtained before. They should obtain an equal share. Ali took one fifth of a slave girl as his share, 
Then Khalid called for Burayda and said, take advantage of it. So Burayda informed the Prophet about what he had done. And I, Burayda, arrived in Medina. I entered the mosque and the Messenger of Allah to the end of the hadith. What here proves that this trip was a hijri? As we said, Rasulullah in 10 hijri was not in Medina. He was in Mecca, just about to go into Hajj. So in this narration, Burayda is saying, after we finished our trip, when we returned, I entered Medina and went to a Masjid al-Nabawi. This proves that it could not have been the 10 Hijri trip again, because had it been the 10 Hijri trip, they would have actually went towards Mecca and informed Rasulullah, not towards Medina. And the next narration is in Musnad Ahmad, volume 12, page 392. Uh, and this is narrated by Amr al-Mashas al-Aslami. He says, I was among the companions of, of Hudaybiyah. He said, I went out with Ali to Yemen, and during my journey, I faced some difficulties until I developed a grudge against him. When I arrived, I expressed my complaint in the Masjid until it reached the Messenger of Allah. I entered the mosque one morning and the Messenger of Allah was present with some of his companions when he saw me. He fixed his gaze upon me and by saying, Amr, by Allah, you have harmed me. I said, I seek refuge in Allah from harming you, O Messenger of Allah. He replied, indeed, anyone who harms Ali has harmed me. This is Isnaduhu Hassan. Uh, and then he goes on to give why it's a Hassan chain. So here again, Amr returns to the Masjid and Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina, not Mecca. Once again, proving that this trip was a Tijri. Um, the next report is in Majma' al-Zawaid, al-Haytami, volume 9, page 129. Uh, this one again is narrated by Amr al-Mashas al-Aslami. It's virtually the same scan. He said, I went with Ali to Yemen. I faced uh, negligence or unfairness from him until I found it within myself when he arrived in Medina. I expressed my complaint about him in the masjid. So once again, he went back to a masjid al-Nabawi. This could not have been Tan Hijra. This next one is in al-Mustadrak al-Sahihayn, volume 3, page 131 to 132. And this one is through a Sahih chain as graded by the Habi. He says, Among the commands of Hudaybiyah, it is reported that he said, We accompanied Ali to Yemen and I faced difficulties during the journey until I found it within myself. When I arrived, I expressed my complaint in the masjid and this reached the Messenger of Allah. So on the morning, I entered the mosque and found the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, surrounded by some of his companions. When he saw me, he fixed his gaze upon me and said, He is saying to take a good look until you sit down. When I sat down, he said, O oh, Amr, by Allah, you have harmed me. I said, I seek refuge in Allah from harming you, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Yes, whoever harms Ali has indeed harmed me. So the very same thing, this one is through a Sahih chain. And this is the final one we will be bringing. This is from Kitab al-Shari'ah, volume 2, on page 225 to 226. He was among the companions of Al-Hudaybiyah. He said, I went out with Ali ibn Talib to Yemen. He was unfair towards me. When we arrived in Medina, I complained to him in the mosque until it reached the Prophet. He said, one day I entered the mosque and I saw the Prophet was there with some of his companions and the Prophet fixed his gaze upon me. When I sat down, he said, oh, Amr by Allah, you pardon me. To the end of the hadith, it's the same one as the previous ones. This proves without a doubt that this trip with Khalid, Warida, and Amr was in 8 Hijri, not 10 Hijri. And this is the one that Ahlul Sunnah constantly quote. Later on, we'll show you 10 Hijri and show why that one doesn't work either. Now for actually refuting this. Refuting the 8 Hijri trip, it can be done through four ways. The very first way is that this expedition took place two years before the event of Ghadir. It's impossible that the Prophet could be addressing something that took place two years ago. That's just beyond impossible. If there was a, a problem between the two companions, Rasulullah is not going to wait two years until he addresses it. That's absurd. That's the first problem with this hadith and this argument. The second issue is that in every variation of the hadith, in every possible one, the Prophet in some way or another tells them, do not, har do not harm Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do not hate Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do not hold a grudge against Ali ibn Abi Talib. Always. In some way or another. The Prophet already solved the issue. There's no reason for the Prophet to come later on and stop at Ghadir and say, be his friend, guys. Because the Prophet already tells him, hey, like, no, don't, don't say this about Ali. Do not hate Ali ibn Talib. Just love him. That's the second issue with this hadith. The third one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 197, فَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا وَلَا الحج. Uh, and in English, that would read, there is to be no intimate relations, foul language, and arguments during Hajj, or during pilgrimage. During Hajj, you cannot argue with your Muslim brothers. So if these people, these companions, had a problem with Ali ibn Abi Talib previous to Hajj, they must have resolved it before going into Hajj. The Prophet is not going to allow them to quarrel with each other and argue before Hajj. They must have fixed this, then they'll go into Hajj with their pure intention. Those are the three problems so far. But this fourth one is the biggest issue with this hadith. This is the, well, with the argument. This is the biggest problem with it. This is the biggest no. This hadith, this argument in general, there is not a single chain. And Hadith al-Qadir is the most mutawatir event of the entire seerah, of our Prophet's entire lifespan. This is the most mutawatir event. Not a single chain. Is there even an indication to Yemen and the problem? This came much, much later on. There's no hadith of a sahabi interpreting it this way. There's no chain where the Prophet references Burayda, Khalid, or a problem in Yemen. Never. 
This belief came much, much later on. Had these two events been linked, like Ahl Sunnah say, then surely in at least one of these chains it would be mentioned, but it's not. This shows you that this is just a complete lie. This came much, much later on. So those are the four ways to address this hadith. Okay? That completely deals with the eight Hijri trip. If the brothers remember, we actually mentioned there was two trips. So let's examine the 10 Hijri trip and see if that one actually holds some credibility to it. In regards to the 10 Hijri trip, it's only found in one source, as, I've, as far as I've seen. Every other source that carries this narration and this trip all take it back from this one original source. The source being al sirah Nabawiyya li Ibn Hisham, volume 4, page 249 to 250. Here, he has a whole chapter where he just talks about the 10 Hijri trip and the return from Yemen. And he brings two hadiths. The first hadith has absolutely nothing to do with the problem. And the second one does. Ibn Ashaq said, Yahya ibn Abdullah, Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Umrah narrated to us from Yazid ibn Talha, bin Yazid ibn Rukana, who said, When Ali, salamullahi alayhi, arrived from Yemen to meet the Messenger of Allah in Mecca, he hastened to the Messenger of Allah and appointed some of his soldiers from among his companions. However, one of the men refused, and every man in the group returned his armor that was with Ali. May Allah be pleased with them. When his, when, the, when his army approached, he went out with to meet them, and he found them wearing different armors. If nothing is, makes sense here, Ali returned, and he had the spoils from Yemen with him. A bunch of armor, a bunch of cool-looking armor, right? He left to go greet the Messenger of Allah, send his salams. When he came back, all this armor that was supposed to be, you know, war booty and distributed, they were all just wearing it. So he returned. Ali, he said, woe to you, what is this? They replied, the people requested it to adorn themselves when they arrived among the people. Like, we want to look good when we go into Mecca. Oh yeah, we just came back from, you know, conquering this place. He said, woe to you, remove it before you reach the Messenger of Allah. So they removed the armors, returned them to the original owners, and the army openly expressed their complaint about what had been done to them. And then Ibn Hisham brings another chain, and he says what happened afterwards. From Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he said, The people complained about Ali. So the Messenger of Allah stood up among us and addressed us. I heard him say, O people, do not complain about Ali. For by Allah, he is the harshest of you in the cause of Allah or in the way of Allah when it comes to complaining. Now, how do we refute this one as well? With this one, there's three ways. All these three ways just refute the argument completely. The very first way, and it's just the most clear. The Prophet already solved the issue. Like right after the Prophet, hey, everyone gather up. Do not hate Ali ibn Abi Talib. Plus, he's the most severe in the cause of Allah among you. That's it. So the Prophet already addressed this. There's no reason for him to address it again in Yemen. The second one, inshallah ta'ala, is they went into Hajj right after this. And again, the same verse that we brought previously from Surah Al-Baqarah, it would still apply. So the Prophet must have solved this before going into Hajj, which like he did. This is assuming we ignore that he already did. The Prophet would have had to. So this cannot be the reason for Ghadir. And the third and final reason, again, there's no mention of this in the Ghadir sermon. Not once was it linked to Yemen and war booty and armor. Not once is it referenced whatsoever during the actual speech of Ghadir. And you would think, because the Prophet, it's a very long speech. People imagine Ghadir to be like a 10 minutes, goes, raises Ali's hand, and they just keep moving. No. It took an hours. This took a while. And there's no mention of it whatsoever regarding the Sahaba and whatnot. That's kind of the first argument. Yemen, that completely refutes that argument. The second one, and this is a very, very famous argument from Ahl Sunnah, they'll basically say, this is known as the Sahaba's interpretation argument. That's what I've labeled it as. But it's a very simple one. You all, you all have heard it. It's if, if the Shia understanding of Ghadir is correct, then how come the Sahaba did not understand it as such? So basically, where did the Sahaba understand it to mean master? That's basically what they're asking. There's three ways to respond to this. This is the refutation for this hadith. The first way is this is a fallacy known as uh, petitio, petitio Principi. And it originates from France, I believe. And it's just known as begging the question. What does this mean? Essentially, the question that they're asking us does not invalidate our argument. So whether or not I can produce a hadith of the Sahaba interpreting it to mean master, it would not refute what I'm saying. That is not an objection. That's not a valid objection. And the way you can understand this is because flip it around on them. They believe it means friend, right? They would have to produce one Sahabi or a hadith of a Sahabi interpreting it to mean friend, and they, they're unable to do so. So by their own standards, this, this wouldn't work. It's not a valid objection because then they would be refuted as well. So that's kind of the first way to answer it. Like it's not even a valid argument in the first place. The second way to answer is very simply that yes, the Sahaba did interpret it to mean master. Where is this found? In Musnad Ahmed, volume 38, on page 541 to 542. I'm going to read this chain out because actually this is the hadith is fully sahih. It's a three-man chain narrated by Yahya ibn Adam from Al-Hanash ibn Harith from al riyah ibn Harith who said, A group of people came to Ali in al rahba and said, Assalamu alaykum ya Mawlana. Peace be upon you, our Mawla. He replied, How can I be your Mawla when you are Arab people? They said, We heard the Messenger of Allah saying on the day of Ghadir Khum, Whoever I am his Mawla, Ali is his Mawla. 
This is the Deva Allah. Rayah said when they left, I followed them and asked, who are these people? They replied, they are a group of the Ansar and among them is Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And the footnote reads, this chain is Sahih. So everyone here in this chain is Thaqa. So they can't weaken, weaken it chain-wise. Now, how do we prove this means master from this hadith? That the, the Sahaba, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari and the Ansar, understood Ghadir to mean master. Because it starts off, the interaction, As-salamu alaykum ya They say, peace be upon you, our Mawla. Ali asked them, how can I be a Mawla when you are of Arab descent? They replied, because on the day of Ghadir Khum, we heard the Messenger of Allah say, Man kuntu mawla mawla. Now, had this been friendship, they would basically be saying, on this day, you became our friend. That wouldn't make any sense, because Ali ibn Talib has many, many friends, previous to the day of Ghadir Khum, among them being Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. There's no way possible that here, friend would make sense. But master fits in perfectly. So that's how we can understand it to mean master, because there's only two interpretations here. That's the first hadith we will bring to show that the Sahaba understood it as such. The second one, the very next scan, Regarding this and the Sahaba's interpretation, this is a very, very well-known scan. You guys are probably all, all part of it. It's found in Tariq Baghdad on volume 9, page 221 to 222. The chain from Shah ibn Hushah from Abu Hurairah. That the Holy Prophet stated on the day of Ghadir Khum. Uh, the Holy Prophet stated, Whoever fasts on the 18th of Dhul Hajjah, Allah will grant him a reward of fasting on 60 months. That is the day when the Holy Prophet grabbed the hand stated on the day of Ghadir Khum. Uh, the Holy Prophet stated, Whoever fasts on the 18th of Dhul Hajjah, Allah will grant him a reward of fasting on 60 months. That is the day when the Holy Prophet grabbed the hand of Ali ibn Talib and stated, Am I not am I not the wedding of the believers of the Mu'mineen? All of them replied, Yes, O Prophet of Allah. To which the Prophet said, Whoever I am his Mawla, Ali is his Mawla. Upon this, Umar ibn Khattab came and said, Congratulations, congratulations, O Ali ibn Abi Talib. Today you have become my Mawla as well as the Mawla of all Muslims. It was then that the verse was revealed. Today I have perfected your religion and completed my bounty upon you. That's Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 3. And that's then in the hadith. This hadith. The first thing, let's examine the chain. So regarding this chain, everyone is thiqa besides two people. right? They're thiqa as well, but they have a problem with their hadith. Who are they? Al-Mattar bin Wadaq, I believe, and Shahar bin Hoshib. Both of these people are reliable narrators. They just had memory problems. Now, Shahar bin Hoshib is from Rajal Muslim and Bukhari. And Muslim and Bukhari, if you narrate inside their books, you're automatically thiqa. So that doesn't matter. Now, in Matar bin Wadaq, if we assume this person had memory problems, this would maximum, maximum, only make this hadith hasan. It would not make it weak. So this chain is acceptable. That's number one. Number two, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani says in his book, Tahrim al-Alat al Tahrim alat al-Tarib by Albani on page 36, what he says is that other chains, are, like chains of hadith, are strengthened through other chains. So if you can produce more, like if there's a Hassan hadith, or even like a weak hadith, but you can produce many, many other weak hadiths, this would strengthen that chain. In regards to this hadith, this one chain is Hassan, but there's multiple weak variations of this hadith. We'll bring two. The ones I have on hand are Musnad Ahmed, volume 30, page 430, and Fala al-Sahaba, volume 1, page 610. So both of these are the same exact narration, just with three weak chains. So this hadith is very established from Rasulullah. And this hadith is way more clear than the previous one, regarding the method of the hadith, because... He comes and congratulates him. So the first issue with the hadith is, why is Umar congratulating Ali ibn Abi Talib if this just means friend? Wouldn't make any sense, right? And also he says, on this day, you have become my mawla, as well as the mawla of all Muslims. So again, had this been friendship, then this wouldn't make any sense because that would mean all the Muslims previous to this were not Ali's friend. And this is just completely just bata. This is not true whatsoever. Without a doubt, this proves that the Sahaba interpreted it to mean authority and not friendship. Those are the two hadiths regarding the Sahaba's interpretation. And assuming somehow, some way, they'll find a way to weaken the Umar one, the Abu Ayyub al-Sali one is just completely sahih, and they can't weaken that whatsoever. So that fully proves our narrative once again. The third argument that they're going to try to use against you guys is, why did the Prophet not make this announcement in Mecca? Right? Had this announcement been so important, had it been as, as a big of a deal as the Shia make it out to be, why didn't the Prophet announce it in Mecca when everyone was there and everyone was listening? Right? Now how do we refute this? Number one, this is another instance of the fallacy known as begging the question. It doesn't matter where he announced it, he still announced it. So you guys saying, oh, why did they announce it there? He could have announced it there. He announced it. The hadith has reached you. You must work with it. So that's the very first way to address this. The second way is that it is not the Prophet's decision when he announces something. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decision. This is because in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 67, Ya ayyuhar rasul balig ma unzila ilaykum min rabbik wa in lam tafa'al fama balaghta rasalata wa Allahu yahsumka min al-nas inna Allah la yahdi al-qawm al-kafirin O Messenger, Deliver what has been revealed to you from your Lord. And if you do not, then you have not delivered his message. And Allah will protect you from the people. Surely Allah will not guide the unbelieving people. 
Allah is telling him, Bellig, announce it now. And that's what he's supposed to announce it. Khalas al mulur It's not his decision when he announces something or doesn't decide to announce it. So that's how you'd refute that argument. Uh, and as Saif mentioned, Allah Hafizullah, he says, I actually skipped over one. This one's very similar to the Sahaba's interpretation, but with a slight tweak. They basically say, if the Shia interpretation is correct, then there's no way that all these Sahaba who heard this would have just disobeyed the Prophet and just left Ali ibn Talib alone. They would have stayed loyal to Ali ibn Talib. So this is one way that we can be sure that the Shia interpretation is wrong. Once again, this is a begging the question fallacy. This doesn't make any sense. Because whether or not they stayed loyal to the announcement of Rasulullah, it does not affect our argument. Like if they just all completely ignored this and disobeyed the Prophet, it, our argument is still valid. This doesn't actually object to our argument. But a very clear way to refute this is that the Prophet, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he predicted this. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This is Al-Mustadrak ala volume 3, page 150. Uh, and Al-Hakim records through two chains the same hadith and they're both sahih. One of the things that the Prophet promised me is that this nation will betray me after him. This is narrated by Ali ibn Talib through one chain. Another chain is Abu Idris al-Audi. No, actually, this is from Ali, but he's the previous narrator. I got mixed up. So it's from Ali and he says this. One of the things that the Prophet promised me is that this nation will betray me after him. So subhanAllah, Sadaqa Rasulullah, we'll say Allah's Messenger told the truth because they actually did betray him. This was his haq, this was his right, and they all just completely betrayed him. And there's other, many, many narrations where the like prophets, like for example, there's one very famous one in Bukhari. I don't have it on hand right now, but it's like the companions will be showed to Rasulullah uh, and they'll be like, oh my companions, and then they're going to be dragged to hell. It's like you did not know what they did after you. So that's one hadith. And actually the same hadith is also recorded in Kitab al Hafid Khayrat al-Mahara, volume 7, page 186, and again in al-Sadraq al-Sahihayn, except in page 153, in the same volume as well. Yeah, no, it's a great addition. So all over the place we see this, that like the Sahaba, like subhanAllah, like the Prophet literally predicted it. And Ali is telling this to the people, it's like the Prophet promised me that everyone's going to betray me. And then as, the, as Brother Saif added, he's going to be the first on the Day of Judgment to complain to Allah's mess, to complain to Allah about what had been done to him, right? So had his like had his sinners interpretation here that all the Sahaba were lovey dovey and everyone loved Ali ibn Abi Talib and all these things, then why is Ali complaining? Why is Ali saying this almost going to betray me that I'm going to be the first to complain? Had it all been the way you guys are making it out to be, you know, had Jim had been a picnic and Safin just been a, a small gathering of lunch <laughs> between the <laughs> anyways, uh, well that we won't we won't sidetrack from the topic, but. Those are the first three arguments. And the fourth one that you're... This is more uncommon, but this one should be addressed because the previous scholars of Ahl did use this one. And this argument is basically known as... What I've labeled it as is the Usama argument. And this one, a lot of people can be like, Wait, what, what's this Usama argument? I've never heard this in my life before. Basically, the argument goes as follows. Usama told Ali ibn Abi Talib, you are not my mawla, only Rasulullah is my mawla. And to this, Rasulullah responded, whoever I am his mawla, Ali is his mawla. So the same thing they did with Yemen, they try saying this is the same exact thing. The context of the hadith when Kutumala for Ali Mawla is that Usama had basically said this. So the Prophet said like, oh Ali, you're not my friend. Only Rasulullah is my friend. And because of this, the Prophet said, whoever I'm his friend, then Ali is his friend. Now we're going to just list the scholars who use this argument. The first one is uh, Al-Jahil, right? And shout out Brother Saif for giving me this, for putting me on this one. Uh, Al-Jahil, and then Rasal Al-Uthmaniyya on page 145, this is what he has to say. Al-Jahad offers two responses. First, he doubts the authenticity of the hadith. Second, he argues that even if it is authentic, it is addressed only to Zayd bin Haratha, the client and former slave of, of, of the Prophet who was ordered to recognize that his tribal, tribal loyalties and clientage extended to Ali as well, since the latter was a Hashemite like Muhammad. It appears that the other Uthmanis, contemporaries with Al-Jahad and Al-Ma'mun, similarly agreed with that the hadith al-Ghadir was a statement that the Prophet made to resolve a personal dispute between Ali and and Zayd. Regarding this, number one, al jahads argument is terrible. Why? Because Zayd ibn Haratha passed away before Ghadir Khum. And another wording, the scholars later on came, and you're going to see that they're like, yeah, that's, and it wasn't Zayd ibn Haratha, rather it was Usama ibn Zayd. So that's the first one. al jahads entire argument is just terrible. His particular argument, because Zayd ibn Haratha passed away before Ghadir Khum, so it couldn't be that reason. Uh, the other scholars who use this hadith, uh, Al Imam al Nawawi, in his book, Fatawa al Imam al Nawawi, on page 252, he says uh, similarly, it is said that the reason for this fighting is that Usama bin Zayd said to Ali, you are not my mawla, or you are not my master, rather my master is the messenger of Allah. Uh, so the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, said, whoever I am his mawla, Ali is his mawla. Right? Now, again, he clarifies that it's Usama and not Zayd. So we're just going to go with this one, since the other one is just completely wrong. Uh, the other scholar who uses this is Al-Mannawi in Faith al-Qadir, volume 6, page 217. 
Uh, and he says again, Man kuntu mulafa Ali Mawla. This means that Ali is his ally, supporter, and one who holds allegiance to Islam. This is because Allah is the ally of those who believe, and He has specifically chosen them. Furthermore, there are many virtues attributed to Ali, including his deep understanding, noble character, impeccable morals, pure intentions, generous disposition, steadfastness, and resolute determination. It is said that Usama said to Ali, You are not my Mawla, my Mawla is only Rasulullah. And then Rasulullah responded to him by saying, uh, Man kuntu mulafa Ali Mawla. But that's regarding al Manawim. He has to say, again, just affirms what Al-Nawawi uh, previously has said. Uh, the final scholar we'll bring is Ma'ani al-Quran al-Kareem on volume 6, page 410 to 411. Abu Ja'far al-Nahas says this, The hadith you mentioned is part of a famous narration known as the hadith of Ghadir Khum. This hadith is related to the, a specific occasion that took place on the day of Ghadir Khum. In this context, the Prophet is reported to have said, kuntu Mawla fa'alin Mawla. Mawla in this context can be understood as guardian or leader. This statement uh, guardian as in wali, you know, from the sense of like support and friendship. This statement is often cited to emphasize the special status of Ali Talib in Islam and his role as a leader among the Muslim as Mola in the Muslim community. Similar thing, the refutation for this argument. This can be done through three ways. The first hadith, the first way to, or the first way to refute this hadith is that there's no chain for it. The people are referencing this hadith, there's no chain for this hadith actually. Academically, it's useless. That's the first way. The second way to address this hadith or this argument is that there is no link of this hadith to Ghadir. Once again, there's no possible way that this could be linked to hadith al Ghadir because not once throughout the, in any chain in the actual sermon of Rasulullah does he mention the Yemen argument or Usama. Never. Right? So these, two com- these are two completely unrelated. Like even if we were to say that this had actually happened and took place, they're two separate events. They're not linked whatsoever. And yeah, as, as the Shaykh noted, this came much later. This whole argument and this interpretation of Hadith al-Ghadir came much, much later. It was not the time of the Prophet. No Sahabi said it. No Tabi'i said it. No Tabi'i Tabi'in said it. Right? It just came much, much later from random scholars. And the third way is that if we were to actually go through and examine the meanings that they want to say that it means, it cannot possibly apply. So let's go one by one. The first meaning is friend. Right? They're trying to say it means friend. Let's examine why this wouldn't make any sense. They say that Osama said, you are not my mawla. Only Rasulullah is my Mawla. So if we were to understand Mawla here to be friend, you are not my friend. Only Rasulullah is my friend. This wouldn't make any sense because Usama has other friends who are not Rasulullah. Quran says, All the believers are brothers and they're friends and they love you, love you. So even by their own Sunni standards, how all the Sahaba love each other and they're all friends, this wouldn't make any sense that Usama would say this. That's the first, first meaning. The second meaning is supporter. Right? If we were to go supporter, not friend. Again, you are not my supporter. Only Rasulullah is my supporter. This wouldn't make any sense because again, in the Munun Ikhwa. Believing with the brothers the, the believings the believers are brothers. Khalas. They're supposed to be helping and supporting one another. So this wouldn't make sense either. Now, emancipator. This wouldn't work as well because uh, the Prophet said he responded, Ben Kuntu Mawla fa Ali Mawla. If Mawla here means emancipator, it means like whoever I am his emancipator, then Ali is his emancipator. Which is not true. Ali did not free these people. Rasulullah is the one who did it. Right? So this wouldn't make sense either. Now, but master here, if we were to take master, master fits in perfectly. Again, if just replacing Mola here with master, you are not my master, only Rasulullah is my master. This would, and then the Prophet would respond, whoever I am his master, then Ali is his master. This fits in perfectly. Makes perfect sense. But the rest of the meanings just contradict each other. They don't make any sense. So that's how we deal with the Islam argument. That honestly wraps up all of Al-Hassan's arguments. Now this is going to be the second portion of the event where we're just going to be going over uh, hadith al Ghadir and some interesting hadiths from the Shia corpus, right? To start off, the greatest thing, the greatest book that I could ever recommend any of the, the listeners is Al Ghadir fi al Kitab wal Sunnah wal Adab by the great Allama Abdul Hussein Ahmed al Amini al Najafi. This book is an amazing book. If you just read, if you just go and open up the book and just read the table of contents. He literally records everything. He has everything you could, you could, wa- you could possibly want in regards to Ghadir. So for the Shias, I would highly recommend this if they really want to go through and read everything regarding Ghadir. That's the best book I would recommend. But now with that being said, let's just move on. So the first thing I have prepped is, do you not know that I have more authority over the believers in themselves from the Shia corpus? That wording that we had already showed multiple times from the Sunni corpus and how it's mutawatir. Let's now show it from the Shia corpus. And also, just letting the brothers know, some of these narrations are very, very long. So I'm going to try to only quote the important parts just for the sake of time. So the first one is in Al-Kafi, Volume 8, Book 1, Chapter 542, Hadith Number 1. Uh, and the Hadith says, 
that Rasulullah informed me that Iblis and the chiefs of his companions witnessed the messenger establishing me, the people at Ghadir Khum, by the command of Allah. So he told them that I had more authority over them than their own selves and commanded those who were present to make it reach the absentees. Right. So very clear hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen. And again, he just says, another important addition here to note is that the Prophet says, make sure to tell this message to those who were not present. Anyone who was absent and did not hear this message, make sure it reaches them. That's a very important addition as well. The next source is in Ma'ani al-Akhbar, uh, book 1, chapter 29, hadith number 8. I heard Allah's messenger say on the day of Ghadir Khum whilst he was holding the hand of Ali, do I not have more authority upon the believers than they have over themselves? They said, yes. He said, whoever I am his mawla, then Ali is his mawla. Oh Allah, befriend those who befriend him and antagonize those who antagonize him, support those who support him and support and abandon those who abandon him. So again, very clearly the Prophet mentions this particular wording. Uh, the next one is in Al-Amali, Book 1, Chapter 1, Hadith Number 2. Shaykh al-Saduq, rahimahullah, recorded the following. Whoever fasts on the 18th of Dhul-Hajjah, Allah records for him 60 months. It is the day, Ghadir, uh, is the day of Ghadir Khum, when the Messenger of Allah took the hand of Ali ibn Talib and said, O people, do I not have more authority over the believers than they have over themselves? They said, Yes, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Whoever I am, his master, Ali is his master. So Umar said to him, Congratulations, congratulations O son of Abu Talib. You have become my master and the master of every Muslim. Then Allah revealed... Uh, this day I have perfected for you your religion. Surah Al-Ma'adah verse 3. That's Al-Amali al-Saduq. The next one is Qurb al-Isnad on page 57. It's narrated in Safwan ibn Jamal. He said, Abu Abi Abdullah, salamullahi alayhi, said, When this verse uh, regarding wilaya was revealed, the Messenger of Allah ordered the people to gather in Ghadir Khum. And then he stood on the pulpit and said, O oh people, whoever I am his master, Ali is his master. Do I not have more authority over you than yourselves? They said, Yes, indeed. He said, whoever I am his master, Ali is his master. Oh Allah, befriend those. Oh Allah, befriend whoever befriends him and be an enemy to whoever opposes him. Then the people were commanded to pledge allegiance to Ali and whoever pledged allegiance to him, no one else should pledge allegiance to him. None of them should speak without his permission. Then Zafar and Hubaytar came and he said, he said to Zafar, Oh Zafar, pledge allegiance to Ali for wilaya. He said, from Allah or from his messenger. He said, from Allah and from his messenger. Then Hubaytar came and said, pledge allegiance to Ali for wilaya. He said, from Allah or from his messenger? He then said, from Allah and from his messenger. Then he returned his attention to Zafar and he said, for the sake of what is raised by the finger of his cousin's son. And that's this is through a sahih chain. Beautiful, beautiful hadith. And to finish off this uh, section, there's a narration in Al-Khasal, book 3, chapter 81, hadith number 1. And this narration is very, very long, so bear with me, brothers. He said, this is from a narration from Abu Tufail, salamullahi alayhi. He said, when God's prophet returned from the Pharaoh pilgrimage, we were with him. When he reached Al-Juhfa, the Prophet ordered his companions to relax. Then the people all settled down. Then they set to the call to prayer and the Prophet said two units of prayer with his companions. Then the Prophet turned towards them and told them, The graceful, the all-aware has informed me that I will die and so shall you. Assume that I have answered God's call. I am held responsible to God regarding what I have delivered to you. Verily, I am leaving behind God's book and his proof. You are held responsible for them. What would you tell your Lord? They said, We will say that you fulfilled your mission, gave us advice and strived. May God grant you the best reward on our behalf. Then the Prophet asked them, Don't you bear witness that there is no God but one, that I am God's Prophet sent to you, that paradise does exist, that hell does exist, and that there is no resurrection after death? They replied, We bear witness to this. The Prophet said, May God bear witness to what you say. I take you as witnesses and bear witness that God is my master. I am the master of all the Muslims. Is it not true that my mastery over the believers is more than that of their own mastery over themselves? Do you believe in this? Will you bear witness to this? They replied, we bear witness to this. Then the Prophet said, whoever I am his, ma whoever I am the master of, Ali is the master of. Then he grabbed Ali's hand and raised it up along with his own hand in such a way that both of their underarms could be seen. Then the Prophet said, oh, uh, oh Allah, please be the friend of his friends and be the enemy of his enemies. Assist whoever assists him and abandon whoever abandons him. I shall leave you and you will meet me again at the heavenly pool later. That is the pool whose width expands from Basra to Sanna. There are as many silver goblets in there as there are stars in the sky. Then I shall question you about what you bear witness to today when I meet you at my pool. I will ask you what you did with the two heavy things and how you dealt with what I have left behind when you meet me. They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what are the two heavy things? The Prophet replied, The greater of the two heavy things is the book of uh, the Honorable and the Exalted Allah. It is the means that is extended from God and I towards you. One side of it is in, uh, is in the hand of Allah and the other side of it is in your hands. The knowledge of the past and what is yet to come until the uh, arrival of the hour is in it. And the smaller of the two heavy things is equal to the Qur'an. It is Ali ibn Abi Talib and his household. These two will be inseparable until they come to meet me at the heavenly pool.
So a beautiful, beautiful report from Al-Khasal. And this is narrated to a Sahih chain, I believe, as well. Moving on next, the next thing from the Book of the Shia is the holy status, the great status of the Day of Khadir. Uh, the narration is found in Mawsu'at Ahadith Ahl al-Bayt, uh, Salam Allah Alayhim, Volume 2, page 173. From someone else, from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, who's Salam Allah Alayhi, who said, Saturday is for us, Sunday is for our Shia, Monday is for our enemies, Tuesday is for the Umayyads, Wednesday is the day for taking medicine, Thursday is the day for fulfilling needs, Friday is the day for cleaning and perfuming. It is the day of the, it is a holy holiday of the Muslims, and it is better than Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. The day of Ghadir is the best of all holidays, which falls on the 18th of the Hajjah. It used to be on a Friday. Used to be on a Friday. Our Qa'im, Ajallah Farajah Sharif, will appear on a Friday, and the day of judgment will occur on a Friday. There is no better deed on Friday than sending salawat upon Muhammad and his family. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil farajahum. Uh, so beautiful report regarding the status of the. Uh, of the holiday of Ghadir. The third wording, the third edition that we're going to be sharing with the brothers, the Prophet's request for the event of Ghadir Khum to be transmitted to those who were absent. So we already showed one scan of this from Al Kafi. The other one is from Hadith al Wilayah by Ibn Aqda on page 59. Uh, and this is under the chapter of the hadiths from Imam Aba Muhammad al Hassan al Mushtaba. And he mentioned, so from Ali ibn al Hussein, from his grandfather Ali ibn al Hussein, who said, so this narration comes from by authority of Zin al-Abidin alayhi salam, he said, and he mentioned the sermon of al Hassan ibn Ali in the presence of Muawiyah and the people. And he mentioned in his virtues of his father and what the Messenger of Allah said to appoint him. Until al Hassan said, and they saw when the Messenger of Allah appointed him in Ghadir Khum and he called out for the acceptance of his leadership. Then he told the ones who saw it to tell the ones that didn't to the end of the hadith. So again, very clearly, the Prophet clearly tells everyone who did, whoever did not see this message, whoever did not hear this message, make sure you inform them of this. So beautiful addition from Two of our Imams, salam Allah alayhim. The third uh, addition is Imam Ali citing Hadith al-Ghadir as a proof of his imamat. They're always going to ask you for this. Where did Ali ibn Abi Talib cite that this is this day he was appointed as the leader of the Muslims, right? They'll always ask for this Hadith. This one is accepted as a Shia source. There's another Hadith, but I believe they'll try to weaken it. But this one is enough for us as Shia. We don't need, we don't need their Hadith. Narrated from Abu Tufail, salam Allah alayhi. He said, I was in the house on the day of Ashura. And I heard Ali say, until he said, So I swear to you by Allah, did the Messenger of Allah say about one of you, whoever I am his master, then Ali is his master? Oh Allah be an ally uh, to, of his allies and an enemy to his enemies? Except me? They said, by Allah, no. So very clearly, he just tells them all, like in the day of the Shura, when they were deciding who was going to be the Khalifa after Umar ibn Khattab, very clearly, he clearly says it. It's like, I'm the only one of you who the Prophet stopped on the day of Ghadir Khum. And said that I am the mullah um, the mul of the believers. No one else has this except me. And they all bore witness to that. So that'll bring the event to an end, inshallah, ikhwan. So we have effectively proven that Amir al Mu'minina, alayhi salam, is the only Khalifa of Rasulullah, the only rightful Khalifa of Rasulullah. Um, we've answered all their shubahat. We've showed the correct methodology one should have when entering it. We've showed how the hadith of Mutawatar beyond any doubts. And we refuted all of their scholars and their claims. Uh, we will end this majlis uh, with Qaraat Surah Al-Fatiha Masbukatan Bas Salawat Ala Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad Wa Ajjil Farajahum